Hello, my name is Pedro Rivera. I'm a professor in the Department of uh, Engineering at Lancaster University. Uh, I hold a Royal Academy of Engineering chair, and the focus of my chair is uh, alloy and microstructure design for additive layer manufacturing. What does this mean? Uh, what this means is that uh, we try to conceive new metallic systems that can be 3D printed. Uh, we focus on laser technologies and we design powder metals that can be 3D printed to create new, elaborate, sophisticated engineering uh, components such as turbine blades, tooling or parts of tooling for the production of um, components or perhaps um, applications such as medical devices, for example, medical uh, you know, implants. In order to do this, we, we need a range of equipment. Uh, some of the equipment is present here. Firstly, uh, one piece of equipment is an arc melter. The arc melter is one that we very recently acquired and we'll be uploading uh, a video with it, showing it. Of course, it needs to be installed first, so that won't be probably the first video that you will see. Then we have a metallography lab, where I'll show a range of equipment that we use to prepare metallic specimens. We also have a, a rolling contact fatigue tester, a fatigue tester for those applications that require cyclic fatigue conditions. We can test them here. And lastly, we have a range of broad range of software uh, that will be presented in a series of videos that allow us to design those metallic systems. So uh, if you come with me, I'll show you through the equipment for which we have already videos prepared for you. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, this is our metallography lab. Um, here's where we prepare some of the metallic samples that we would like to inspect. At the end of the lab will be a microscope. But in order to get to the microscope uh, level, uh, we first need to have small metallic samples. These are mounted in bakelite, which is a plastic that allows you to manipulate that specimen to be later on inspected. So that is mounted here. And later on, in, in order to mount them or to shape them appropriately, we have a disc cutter. So many of the samples will come in big chunks of metal. And that metal has to be chopped and flattened and the first step in flattening is to use this precision, this cutter machine. Once the cut specimen that is mounted in backlight is ready, then of course the surface of it will usually be rough. And what we need to be able to see a metallographic sample under the microscope is um, in the absence of a rough sur surface, so we generally want a mirror-like surface. And here's these polishing list discs that allow us to do that. The polishing discs are for uh, essentially this shaped sandpaper with um, different um, number of particles per unit area. When there's a lot of particles or let's say salt abrasive grains, then you create a smoother surface because you rub them with small pieces of sand, let's say. So we can do it at various steps, from coarse to fine grain, uh, you know, sandpaper. Uh, but this can be done automatically. Here, for instance, we can mount uh, up to six of those small uh, samples, and they uh, can, this is a kind of a robot that can uh, perform this simultaneous polishing of the samples. Uh, some of those samples, sometimes before actually mounting them or just inspecting them, uh, we would like to have a um, microscope which is not very coarse. So that would be this, um, this is almost like a magnifying lens but with a camera installed on it. So magnification is low, um, but as opposed to that we have this uh, uh, optical microscope which has a magnification of about uh, thousand times, that means that we can see uh, features that can go down 
to one thousandth of a millimeter, the micron range. A lot of these uh, samples and applications are very interesting in terms of uh, understanding how hard they are. And this is a hardness tester. The hardness tester, uh, by applying a force with a sharp tip, if the tip is produces a so-called indent, a mark that is very large, then the material is soft. And if it's tiny, then it will be hard. And um, yeah, we have specimens that uh, roughly look like this. So these are the mounted specimens I was referring to. They are mounted in bakelite, which is this uh, plastic that is surrounding the gray mirror-like samples that you see here. And um, often, in order to get to this level of um, very uh, you know, uh, precise specimens that need to be inspected, uh, we would like to have a heat, treat heat treatment on the samples. And for that, right behind the computer, you will see a uh, tube furnace. This tube furnace uh, can achieve temperatures up to 1600 Celsius. Um, the atmosphere can be controlled so it can be an in inert atmosphere so that rapid oxidation doesn't take place. So in summary, this is the range of equipment that you need for cutting samples, mounting them in bakelite, uh, polishing them up to a mirror-like uh, level so that they can be inspected in a coarse manner uh, or in a very fine manner with various microscopes and hardness can be tested and this could be the result of the heat treatment with some of the furnaces that we have here. So there are many uh, metallic systems that are of interest. Uh, one of them is um, uh, bearing components. Uh, bearing components or shafts or cams are very very hard. Um, they are so hard for instance that um, if these were a wire with a wire of uh, one and a half millimeters in diameter, you could lift uh, more than one ton in weight. So these are very strong materials, and uh, that's why they are used for these applications that uh, require hardness or contact between elements. Some of those elements are, for instance, these um, balls, and that's what forms a bearing. So uh, the key problem is in these very hard components, fatigue. Although the hardness of the surface is very high, it's possible that cracks develop at the subsurface. And those cracks, uh, when they grow, they make the material fail uh, in a form that is called rolling contact fatigue. In order to replicate this sort of fatigue, we use this type of machine. So this machine has uh, four stations, and these four stations locate these test rods appropriately. And this system that is in here, uh, these springs allow to control the force of the ball onto the rod. And in that way we can count the number of cycles up to fatigue. And fatigue is detected when vibration starts because spalls form on the material surface and vibration starts. They don't need to entirely break. Once vibration is increased, uh, it is known that the fatigue test has concluded. This can take uh, from hours to several years, depending on the applied force. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Hussein Eskander Sabzi. I've been studying as a PhD student at Lancaster University under the supervision of Professor Pedro Rivera. My work is focused on um, alloy design for IDT manufacturing. Uh, in order to do alloy design, we need to use, um, we need to combine computational methods with uh, thermodynamic uh, calculations, uh, which can be uh, calculated by um, different software like uh, Thermocalc. In here, I'm going to show you an example of uh, how to use Thermocalc in order to design alloys for IDT manufacturing. Solidification is the most important physical phenomenon that occurs during additive manufacturing. Then, to control additive manufacturing processes, it's necessary to predict solidification characteristics. This can be done via Schwarz calculator, which is one of the applications of 
thermocast software, as you can see in here. In energy manufacturing processes, solidification typically occurs under non-equilibrium conditions. In other words, the cooling rate is too high to allow time for complete redistribution of alloying elements according to equilibrium. This means that equilibrium calculations may not always provide a good representation of the state in a material following solidification. The Charles Gulliver equation, which is very well known, and its derivatives that are utilized by the Charles calculator account for the reduced or limited diffusion taking place in the solidified structure in a relatively simple but efficient manner. This therefore provides a better estimate of the actual state of the material following solidification. By using the Schild calculator, it is thus possible to obtain a more accurate estimate on, for example, which phases are present in the microstructure, the solidification temperature range, the extent of segregation, and something like that. For a material following certification and prior to any subsequent heat treatment. So, using short simulation, I'd like to show you how to simulate a certification process. So, in here, firstly, you need to put uh, the chemical composition of the alloy to the software. As you can see, the chemical typical chemical composition of the 316 and stainless steel has been input into the software and in here you can determine that which of those elements are fast diffusers for example interstitial elements such as carbon and nitrogen are assumed as fast diffusers in these uh, simulations so if you click on perform three after a few seconds, this software gives us um, the Shoy simulation diagram, as you will see in a few seconds. It is calculating the power equilibrium conditions. So, as you can see in here, the more fraction of the solid upon certification based on temperature as uh, degrees Celsius are modeled uh, via Schild calculations, you can see that if any segregation is not present during certification, the equilibrium conditions are like this. Certification starts at around 1450 degrees C and it will end by uh, 14 18 degrees C, but if segregation is present during certification, which is typical of processes such as laser particle diffusion and its manufacturing, so uh, certification has a different path and um, it starts from uh, 1450 degrees C, but it ends at temperatures around 1350 degrees C. Uh, so, in here you can see what phases. Uh, will be stable during certification. For example, red line shows that at these temperatures you will have uh, liquid and BCC phase, which is delta phi right in here. And uh, when temperature decreases more, uh, we will have liquid BCC and FCC phase, which is also nice in the case of 316 and steel. So, a short simulation can give you. Um, the mole fraction of the solid at different temperatures, the solidification temperature range, which is in range of 100 degrees C in here, and also uh, the effect of segregation on solidification path, which is the comparison between the real solidification and uh, the equilibrium conditions. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm uh, Tom Abram, I'm Senior Project Engineer with the Engineering Engagement Team uh, who are primarily concerned with business engagement with the Engineering Department. So we deal a lot with SMEs but also with large companies and multinationals. Uh, we've been here 
long time, uh, we're in our 19th year now, uh, doing this sort of work. Now over those years we've built up quite, a, quite an extensive range of additive manufacturing equipment. So this area is our FDM uh, suite of machines, uh, predominantly Ultimakers. So we've got uh, Ultimaker 2 Pluses, uh, Ultimaker 2 Plus Extended, uh, we've got an Ultimaker 3 and a couple of Ultimaker 5s. Now they're the workhorses, that's what we generally tend to use more often than anything else. Simply because they're easy to use and they're cheap to run. Um, so we do a, a lot of projects, we do a lot of projects with businesses, um, but we also do some undergraduate uh, work, we do some uh, work with academics and researchers and do our own research with them. So if we need to build anything larger, still using the same technology, we've uh, acquired um, two machines from a manufacturer called Builder. So we've got the Extreme Pro 2000 here. So that will build up to, well build plate 700 square, up to 1.7 meters tall. So this is about, this is a, 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 obviously a turbine blade, um, and this is about half the maximum height that we can go to. Okay, so this is our um, Builder 1500. Um, very similar to the 2000, but um, a slightly different aspect ratio. So this has got a build bed of 1100 by 500 millimeters with a build height that's slightly shorter, but 820 tall. We've also got uh, our suite of um, reprocessing equipment. So we've uh, got this set of equipment from a company called 3D Evo. So we've got the filament, uh, well, the polymer shredder um, to reprocess um, failed prints, uh, support material, that sort of thing. And then we've got the pellet dryer to dry those pellets. And then we can feed them into this machine to um, extrude our own filament. So I'm not just reprocessing of existing materials but we can also start playing around with new materials putting additives in that sort of thing to make our own specialist filament okay so this section is our resin machines um, so here we've got uh, several machines from a company called photocentric who specialize in what's called dpp uh, sort of daylight polymer processing um, so it takes a photoreactive resin, shines a light on it, where it, the light hits it, it the resin hardens. Um, we've got the uh, large machine here, which is the Magna, um, that's got quite a large build volume, about 500 by 400 by 300 build volume. Um, then we've got a couple of smaller machines. Uh, we've got the HR2, um, that's probably uh, about A5 size by about two or three hundred tall um, and then we've got a, a smaller machine um, that's around A6 uh, but more precise so if we want to do smaller but higher quality models we can do on the LC precision. We've also got um, a Form 2 and we're in the process of acquiring a couple of Form 3s as well. Okay so this is our Stratasys J750 which is a, uh, a polyjet machine, which again uses, this uses a UV curing resin, and jets it out of, uh, it's ostensibly inkjet heads here, and there's six material heads and two support material heads. Um, sprays it onto this bed, that's about 450 by 300 by 300. Uh, I can't remember the exact build area, but. Um, so what this will allow us to do is do full colour print, similar to your inkjet printer where it blends the different coloured materials, but it will build it up in layers so you get a full colour 3D print. It will also allow us to mix different resins, so we've got an ABS mimic and various other ones, flexible mimics, and you can blend those to tailor the properties of whatever you're building infinitely effectively throughout the park. Um, so you can go from uh, a, a fully rigid material at one end to a, a, a fully flexible material at the other end and blend that 
through the through the part so every single node can have a different blend of materials. Almost impossible to do with any other process, certainly conventional. So we're in a different lab now, but this is um, our powder material processing area. So here we've got two metal um, uh, 3D printers. So this one is uh, Realizer 100, and this uses um, metal powders uh, and a, a fiber laser to um, melt the powder together in individual layers, typically around 50 microns, uh, to form a solid part that's almost 100% dense. Um, the machine next to it is our newest uh, acquisition. Um, this is the Meltio 450. Um, now this uses a combination of wire extrusion uh, and metal powder spraying. Um, so we can, we can have multi-material um, extrusion, so we can blend different materials together um, and also spray various materials from a hopper um, with the air feed, uh, the argon feed. Okay, so this is the uh, 3D Systems S-Pro60. Now this processes polymer powders, um, typically nylon 11, nylon 12, but there's also flexible uh, powders, there's um, investment casting powders that you can put in, you can put glass fill powders and various other things. Um, spreads a layer of powder, uses a CO2 laser to sinter that powder together. And this, exactly the same process, but on a smaller scale, is the uh, Lisa by a company called Sintere. Um, we're in the process of getting two of the latest iterations of the leases and um, does the same job as that but because it's smaller it's easier to turn the machine around and um, to reprocess the powders to sift them and everything else and load the machine but obviously not as big a build volume not as powerful a laser and um, the last machine is the uh, the Solidscape uh, Z Studio in the corner. Now that's um, quite a specialist machine. That will only print in wax, and it's specifically designed for investment casting. Um, very, very precise. It's by far our most accurate machine and most precise machine, with layers going down to around six microns. I'm one of the mechanical engineering technicians in the engineering department at Lancaster University. This is our CNC machining section which we have down here. It's going to tell you a little bit about the machines which we have down here. So this machine that I'm stood alongside here, this is our XYZ 500LR. So it has a workspace inside the machine of 500 millimeters by 300 millimeters. So we can put large components in the machine to machine them, even though the machine has a reasonably small surface area. Um, the controller is an A to 8D Siemens controller. It also has a DXF recognition file on the controller as well, which enables us to go from DXF files to a CNC program straight away once we input that into the USB port on the machine. So this is our Haas ST10. So we've had this for about 12 months now. It is a fully autonomous machine, as you can see. It's got automatic door, it's got an automatic probe system on it as well, as well as a 6,000 RPM spindle. So because it has a 6,000 RPM spindle, it enables us to machi machine extremely small parts. Because as the parts get smaller, we need to increase the spindle speed to be able to accommodate the surface speed and machine them. With the, probes, with the probe on the machine, we can also probe the tooling on that turret there to within a couple of microns. Accompanied with the 6,000 RPM spindle, we can machine extremely small parts to extremely good tolerances, like plus or minus 3 microns. So we can work collaboratively with this machine and this machine to create really small intricate parts. So this is our TL1 pass lathe, we've had this for about 6 months now. So this machine, whilst it is a CNC lathe, it is also a manual machine as well, it's almost like a hybrid. So it has a manual controller just like you would find on an old fashioned conventional lathe, it has your Z axis and your X axis. The reason why 
we opted for a machine like this is because we do a lot of one-offs, we do a lot of bespoke components. So utilising the manual side of it, we can get stuck into the machine and see exactly what we want to machine, just like you would on an old conventional machine. But besides that, it still has Hassi's version 2 advanced manufacturing controller. So on this controller, it utilises a VPS system, visual programming system, which enables the operator to stand at the controller and program really complex parts reasonably quickly without having to use a CAD CAM package. This machine that we've got here, this is our MCO new CNC lathe. So, whilst this lathe is a lot smaller than the other two that we've got in this room, it still utilises a 3000 RPM spindle, so we can machine quite small components on it as well. The good thing about this machine is it's a controller. It has two different programming um, simulations on the controller. It has Siemens and it has Fanuc. So it's a lot more user friendly. Students can use it, postgraduates, academics. Everyone can reasonably understand how to use this machine after a couple of hours on it. The machine that we've got here, so this is a four axis CNC milling machine. So it has an A axis, can enable us to machine really, really good profiles. Five axis simultaneous sometimes, but four axis indefinite. Has a 3000 RPM spindle just like the other M core machine and it utilises the same software as the other M core machine as well, Siemens and Fanuc. So we have a lot of different options to pick from when we come to program the machine. So this is another one of our CNC machines which we have in the department. This is our XYZ710 VMC. This is a much larger CNC machine. It has a 710mm workspace area. It also has box slideways, so it enables us to take bigger, deeper cuts in, in whatever material we are manufacturing, so we can machine bigger components. It enables us to make things like this, uprights for racing cars out of 70-75, aircraft spec aluminium, extremely quickly and extremely precisely. It also utilises Siemens' latest 840D controller, which will use 5-axis simultaneous machining. As well as having this CNC machine here as well, we have a hydraulic folder behind us, so it enables us to fold sheet steel, sheet aluminium up to 10 millimetres of thickness and we also have a hydraulic guillotine here as well which enables us to cut the material before we eventually fold it. So this is our high pressure water jet cutter which we use on a regular basis. It fires a jet of water out of this tungsten carbide nozzle here between 60 and 70 thousand psi. We also add garnet onto that which enables us to cut through materials up to three inch uh, thickness of steel. We use Flow's own software on our console here, which enables us to input DXF files straight from CAD models. And then once we've put the material onto the machine there, it's as simple as just setting the flow path and away you go. We can cut through a variety of different materials reasonably quickly. So this is our recently refurbished Formula Student Lab, refurbished 12 months ago. So we've got all brand new units in here that are all tooled up for the Formula Student team to be able to successfully manufacture and assemble their Formula Student race car, which we do every year. For the last five years now, the race car has been electric. So we're utilising high voltage technology and accumulator batteries like the one that we've got on the side here, instead of an internal combustion engine. So the students fully design and manufacture the car at Lancaster University and will assemble it in this lab. So these are our latest investment. These are our two new universal robots. This is a UR10 and this is our UR5. The UR10 has the capability to pick up 33 kilograms over its overall length. This has the capability to pick up about 20 kilograms. The UR10 and the UR5 are both compatible with the latest vision system that is on the UR10 now. So this has the capability to see components and see objects and locate them and pick them up and move them to other directions or just interact with that object. Like I said, both these machines can use that software. They also both have a tablet like this with the latest universal, universal robot software on them. So you can actually program these robots stood working collaboratively with the robot. Or if you wanted to, you could use this software on a PC and program it offline and then bring that program to the robot. So this is our IRB140 laser welding robot from ABB. So it's very similar to the universal robots. It gives you a pendant and you can program it at the pendant or sat at the computer and program it offline. It's a laser welding robot, so it fires a laser out of the nozzle here down to the bed plate we've got on the floor. So it can MIG weld together components or it can laser weld 
different materials together so it enables us to weld with the door shut with no risk to the operator at all. So this is our Instrom 3382, so it's one of our brand new testing machines. It has a 100 kilonewton load cell on it and it also enables us to test in tension and compression. We've also got different rigs that we can fit to this machine, so we can do three point bend tests, four point bend tests, and we can also input different outputs and inputs into the machine to test different pieces of equipment as well. This machine that we've got here as well, this is our other brand new Instrom testing machine, so this is a 3345. This enables us to put different load cells onto this machine, so at the moment we've got a 5 kilonewton load cell on here. We can also put 500 newton load cells onto it and 100 newton load cells. So we can actually go down the range to achieve better accuracy when we're actually testing components. Again, this enables us to test in compression and in tension and enables, enables us to put three point bend tests, four point bend tests onto this machine as well. The controllers on these machines utilize Blue Hill Universal software. So it's the latest testing software as well, which provides graphs, it provides Excel data sheets, it provides everything from that initial test. So this is our bespoke mechanical testing area. So it utilizes a strong floor. It has a matrix of steel underneath this, underneath this concrete here, which allows us to bolt this giant Meccano to it and assemble bespoke rigs. As you can see, we've got a couple of examples already assembled here. We can then attach hydraulic rams to these bespoke rigs and test bespoke components or assemblies underneath these rigs. As well as housing the matrix of steel underneath the floor. We also have an overhead crane and some big double doors there so we can have giant assemblies, giant vehicles in here. We can test a variety of different things. Whilst having this bespoke mechanical testing area, we also have these industrial testing machines, similar to the Instrom testing machines we have in the other lab. So this 8802 Instrom testing machine here can test up to 250 kilonewtons. The Amsler will test up to 200 kilonewtons and the Avery testing machine we've got down here will test up to 500 kilonewtons of force. All three of these machines will test in compression and in tension and the Instrom machine also has an oven attached to the back of it so we can actually test at different temperatures as well.